Hello, everyone, and welcome to this HomebrewCon online seminar, Field to Homebrew Pint, Hop Breeding, and HBC Hop Variety Overview, sponsored by LD Carlson and Yakima Chief Hops. My name is Joe Damgard with the American Homebrewers Association. Just want to share a couple quick tips before we hand it over to Steve with Yakima Chief Hops. Um, make sure you add any questions using the Ask the Question feature at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'll get to as many of those as possible at the end of the session. Uh, if you have any difficulties, I think you know all the tips for now. Usually a quick refresh will do or pause and play. If there's some other things you can do if you run into issues. Just feel free to chat us if anything does come up. Um, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Steve right off the bat. Steve, why don't you go ahead and take us away? Thank you, everybody, and good afternoon and welcome. Uh, my name is Steve Thompson. I'm here to talk to you about Built to Pint Homebrew. Homebrew. Uh, Built to Pint Homebrew. Uh, Hop breeding and hop breeding company hop variety overview. Again, I'm Steve Thompson, Central Region Sales Manager for Yakima Chief. I travel throughout five states here in the Midwest, um, visiting breweries, helping craft breweries with their hop needs. A little bit about my background: I come from a microbiology, food safety um, focus initially in my career. Worked for five years at Dogfish Head Craft Brewery in Delaware help them manage their quality program as the lab supervisor. I spent five years in Tucson, Arizona at Barrio Brewing Company uh, managing their operations and the past three years with Yakima Chief Hops. So let's jump right into this presentation. Who is Yakima Chief Hops? Our mission is to connect family hop farms to the world's finest brewers. And our vision is to be the global supplier of choice. We ship hops all over the globe focused on sustainably produced innovative hop products. Uh, we strive to be a responsible neighbor, an asset to our communities, enriching the products, businesses, and lives of everyone we encounter. And we really try to live by our pride statement, which is passion for people, product, planet, and process, respect, teamwork, and collective responsibility, integrity, being transparent and accountable in all we do, a uh, very important dedication to quality and sustainability, and an overall emphasis on excellence, uh, innovating, and continuously improving. Growers, we're the only 100% grower-owned hop company. Our grower families have been harvesting hops in the Pacific Northwest since the 1800s and have acquired a wealth of knowledge and expertise throughout the decades. Um, can't stress enough, a lot of these uh, growers are fourth-generation hop farmers. Having that historical knowledge around how to um, optimally grow these varieties, uh, pick windows, how to, you know, do everything optimally so that the brewer is receiving the highest quality hops. Uh, these pictures, some of our grower owners, that's our board of directors. I know all of these people personally. It's a great tool for me to have to know them, um, know what they're trying to achieve, and then getting that to the brewers, uh, that information to the brewers, and then getting the brewer feedback uh, back to these growers. The list to the left is some of the family farms. I encourage you to Google some of these farms, read about their, read about their stories, um, you know, what they're doing and what the future holds. Three good ones to focus on for this talk, Carpenter Ranches, BT Loftus Ranches, and Peralt Farms. Are the three farms and the three families that started Yakima Chief Ranches in the 80s, which we're gonna talk a little bit about on the upcoming slides as it feeds into our breeding program. Yakima Chief Ranches, uh, formerly called Select Botanical Group, is our partner from propagation to pint. They work with the hop breeding company to develop new hop varieties. So hop breeding company, or if you've seen HPC in front of a number, that is shared between John Haas and uh, Yakima Chief Ranches. So that breeding company started in 2003. Um, Yakima Chief Ranches is an integrated crop management company specializing in breeding new hop varieties for the global brewing industry. Really important, Footprints. It's a comprehensive brand management program that ensures the highest level of attention is given to the growing and harvesting of hops. I had a hop grower tell me that the best quality program for a grower is Footprints in the field. So this is something where we're really focused on the varieties that come out of a breeding program how do we assure that they don't drift over time, that Citra in 2020 is going to be the same as Citra in 2025? So when you look back, you're not like Citra's 
you know, migrated towards something else that, that we're looking to keep the genetics of the variety pure and, and just really keeping all the things in that variety that the brewers want to brew with and that makes great beer. Hot brands, varieties, and blends. We have a portfolio of over 80 varieties. So American hops from the Pacific Northwest. Um, and then these are gonna be used obviously to deliver aroma, flavor, and bitterness. Um, I think that we really focus on growing great American aroma hops. That's where our grower, growers live, that's what they grow. Um, Washington, Oregon, and Idaho being the states when I refer to the Pacific Northwest. We also select and import some hops from Germany, New Zealand, and England. So we have these available to brewers as well. Um, if they're doing hop contracts and they wish to add on varieties that we don't grow, we do have access to some of those. So at the bottom of the slide, you'll see a timeline of hop brands as they have been released through the hop breeding company. 1997, we see a Tonum as being brand YCR1. In 2000, we saw the release of Simcoe and Warrior. 2003, Palisade. I mean, personally, I really love Palisade. Um, I've had people tell me Palisade is not an exciting hop, but what's exciting about it to me is that you can use it in almost any beer style, from Pilsner to IPA. If I owned a brewery, I'd probably have some Palisade on hand. Um, and then we'll see as we go into 2007, we see the release of Citra. 2012, the release of Mosaic. 2014, the release of Equinot, 14 Equinot, 16 Laurel. And then in 2018, we released our most recent commercialized hot brands. Sabro being a very unique cultivar, it's very coconut forward, uh, very much a pina colada notes to it, a very unique, it's a Neo-Mexicanus variety. And we see Pato, which is our newest high alpha bittering hop. Pato, has a really late pick window. So it will be picked the last days of September, even the first couple of days of October. So one thing that we will see and kind of I see as a trend with some of the high alpha bittering hops is the um, potential for onion garlic notes. Uh, growers love to have their high alpha hops hang on the vine as long as they can allow it. It drives the alpha levels up, which is what we want. That can also tend to lead to elevated things we don't want. Pato tends to stay really green, it's picked really late, and it tends to keep a really clean aroma. So that is already the number 10 um, acreage hop in the US. So very quickly, we've seen uh, breweries very interested in Pato as a bittering hop. What are the goals of hop breeding? So we really wanna see an intersection of grower needs and priorities with brewer wants. So we, we want to make sure that neither side is really dictating 100% what the goals of the hot breeding program and has to intersect. So high yielding, what does that mean? That means what can the grower expect to get per acre? How many pounds per acre of this variety can I expect? Um, how many cones are going to be on the vine? Um, those are things that are looked at during the breeding process. And then high alpha acid cultivars. So growers love to see that safety net of having high alpha acid. Um, say that there's a lot of hops that comes in and it has less than desirable sensory attributes. It could be sent to be extracted into generic alpha. Older hop pellets in the warehouse that we no longer wish to sell could be uh, turned into generic alpha. And that might serve to go to macro uh, breweries to be used in macro loggers as a kind of a generic alpha product or almost like a commodity. So they love to see high alpha acids in the new varieties that come out. <clears throat> we may wish to improve upon the classics currently in the market. So varieties that brewers already know and love and use and brew with, we might wish to come up with an alternative to say Centennial or Nugget, something that maybe it picks really early. Um, it has some aspect that's very beneficial to the grower and it will be easily able to be slotted into the, into the brewer's portfolio of hop usage. Kind of contrasting, you know, we also look for new and unique cultivars with novel aromas and flavors. And when I mentioned Sabro previously, a perfect example, 
of something that is very unique that came through the breeding program. So Jason Peralt from Peralt Farms, who houses the breeding program, will describe Sabro as the most unique cultivar to come through the breeding program, is having that high oil content, um, very coconut forward, and very much pina colada notes. It just slots really well into New England style IPAs, juicy IPAs, and it's uh, been very popular and it's definitely gonna stick around and be used um, very prevalently going forward. Now, or is it the specialty or, or dual purpose hop? When I refer to Palisade as being dual purpose, that's something that can be very much beneficial uh, in the decision-making process as we proceed through the, the breeding program. Most importantly, desirable brewing characteristics. So maybe we're looking at the varieties in the breeding program as they relate to having a very specific oil component that is very desirable. So something like linalool, geraniol, varieties that have high or elevated levels of those are obviously very important. And a lot of the growers are very excited to think about breeding varieties and having varieties specifically for one oil component, knowing that the craft brewer in the end could blend that pop with other varieties to come up with something that will really make a beer pop and really make a style stick out. Or maybe we're looking for specific levels such as low cohemulone. Um, historically, low cohemulone has been associated with less harsh bitterness, kind of a smoother bitterness. That's a little bit debated currently, but that's something where with the bittering varieties, a lot of brewers will really look for low cohemulone levels. So things like that will factor greatly into the, the, the process of deciding um, how to make a variety move forward or how do we change it, what do we cross it with uh, to kind of achieve the end goal. We also want pest resistance. Um, there's lots of pests that exist above and below ground. Um, they'll attack the leaf, attack the cone, eat the rhizome. So we definitely want varieties that show high resistance to this. A disease resistance being mold, mildew, viruses, things that can cause yields to really drop or actually threaten the variety's existence going forward, and then good storage stability. So, you know, as a as a hop is picked and kilned and baled and then delivered to say Yakima Chief Hops pellet plant, how well does that store in cold storage? Like, can can it last four months? And what happens to the well contents over time? Uh, good storage stability is, is really, really important, and that can lead to efficiencies in within the production plant to be able to schedule varieties to be pelletized uh, in a timely manner. But the end goal is to definitely develop varieties that exhibit characteristics shared by growers and brewers alike. And again, that's the that's the biggest takeaway from this um, from this goal slide. Uh, breeding program, new variety, good yield, disease resistant, good quality stores well at the farm level. What's it going to cost us? What are we going to get out of it in a yield? Us as handlers, um, how does it store? You know, what efficiencies will, will we see in our processes? Even extracting a high oil variety, you know, does it gum up the system? How well does it, how well does it work? And then in the end, is, is it for the bird? Is it a product that adds efficiency, quality, flavor, and then ultimately um, the cost has to make sense for them as well. The slow chart kind of shows the propagation to pint, starting with the farm, and then we have that footprint there where they're going to kind of plan and, and manage what we what's grown and harvested. And it could be you know an acre, it could be five acres. You know we're just going to start with some with some small uh, plots of, of hops, still going to be received and packaged, uh, still going to ship it to brewers. And this brewery step is what's really important here. So the brewer is going to know the harvest date of the lab at the lab analysis, but ultimately, what beers are they brewing with it? Where does it fit in their in their recipes? How are they using it? What do they think? That feedback is so important to go back to the growers in the breeding program. Um, we're going to have a little, even some quotes and contracts. So if a variety is fairly far along in the process, brewers might contract it for a couple years. That contract's going to give the grower security to know, hey, we can increase acreage, we can grow more because we know that brewers are gonna brew with it, and then they're gonna plan and procure to move forward with more acreage, or maybe they don't. So this is sort of like a quick, a high level overview of how it all interrelates. The breeding program life cycle. So 11 years to breed and release a commercial hot brand. And in the end, this kind of blows my mind to think about, but 
you might have had 40,000 genotypes and now you're down to one plant or, or, or one genotype that makes up the, the entire crop of, of, say, Simcoe or Citra or Mosaic. It could cost over a million dollars to bring this new brand to market. So the, this slide and the next slide will show kind of like six steps through the breeding program. So step one is the parental selection where we're kind of looking at existing varieties or varieties that maybe are in process or in the experimental process and they're displaying some positive thing like early pick window, high yields, and we're going to start doing crosses to see what we come up with. Then we're going to move into the early selection, which is a greenhouse screening with a 10% selection rate. So we're still kind of whittling down and whittling through the less than desirable and kind of picking out the best of the best and get to the intermediate selection, which is where they're, we're going to grow them on trellises. Um, there's a single hop field on Peralt Farms where it's rows and rows of experimental plants with number tags hanging on them. They're all sizes, they're all heights, different heights, different morphologies. And these are all in, all in this process to where we're starting to evaluate what attributes do they have you know, does it meet those goals that we discussed? And then we're going to still only maybe select 1% out of this. Going over to advanced selection, where we're going to go back to, to kind of growing them in pots, 2% selection rate. And then elite trial is where it gets really interesting for me. And I like to kind of compare it to going to a, a car show or an automotive show, and you have concept cars and there's something that the consumer can, can drive and they can look at it and they know it's a car and it's, you know, it's getting closer to be commercially available. At this point, we're going to be growing these hops, you know, at, at higher level acres. Brewers are brewing with them. They're giving us that feedback because we want, when we go to step six of commercialization, we want the brewers to be ready for it, to pull it into the market, to know what it is, to know how to use it. And, and, and that's the goal. So if we have two or three, varieties in this elite trial level, you know, all three could go through, none could go through. We're just looking for ones that are on the cusp of, of being uh, commercialized. So I'll give you the example of in 2000, when Sabra or Simcoe was released, we had warehouses full of Simcoe because brewers were like, what is this? Like, how do we use it? Like, you know, how do we brew with it? And, and it took a little bit of, of time to actually, you know, push it into the market to have them um, familiar with it. Whereas Sabro, when that came out um, in 2018, brewers were ready for it. They were, they, were, they were pulling into the market, and it was very successful. So it kind of shows a little bit over time how we've um, modified this to where we're really looking for that brewer feedback. And when it comes into this step six that, you know, it, it's ready to go and, and people know, you know what, they're, what they're buying. Public varieties versus hot brewing company varieties. So public varieties, and I'll just use Cascade and Chinook as examples, they also came from breeding programs uh, that are in the public domain. So maybe the USDA developed some varieties. It could be from grants from the Brewers Association, et cetera. And, you know, they, they're, um, they're out there. Anybody can grow them. They can grow them in Michigan. You'll see them grown in Wisconsin. Uh, they're all around. So the difference would be Citra, Mosaic, and Warrior coming out of our breeding program we're still tied to um, our quality programs as far as keeping tight parameters on these hops through uh, our Green Chief quality program or a footprints program um, in the fields, keeping the genetics of these hops as pure as we can be. That being said, there's nothing wrong with Cascade and Chinook, um, but that can come down to individual farming practices as opposed to a comprehensive um, quality program. So. This is one of my favorite slides that, that I present, and it's called, quote, survivables. So on this chart, you'll see lots of hop varieties listed, and the varieties are broken down by what components are in these hop varieties that survive the process. So think of heat in your kettle, your whirlpool. Think of CO, um, fermentation and CO2 off-gassing. Even think of oxidation. If I use these hops, more is going to survive and express in my beer. So to the left, you'll see varieties that contain higher levels of these compounds. And I would focus really on the yellow, which is linalool, the light blue geraniol, and kind of the dark blue, which is 3-mercaptohexanol, or often called 3-MH. These three compounds 
really translate to biotransformation, to elevated citrus, to elevated tropical, things that are really um, currently desirable in New England IPAs and juicy IPAs. So this is kind of a good resource to kind of look at if you're thinking, I want to make a new recipe, I want to use uh, hops during an early active fermentation dry hop, or I want to use them in my whirlpool, kind of strategically pick. And you'll see mosaic and citra to the left um, contain a lot of these compounds. I will put a little uh, note on that the hops to the right aren't, there's nothing wrong with these hops, they're great hops. You just might wish to choose to use them, say, post-fermentation dry hop, as, as opposed to kind of throwing them in your, in your, in your hot side uh, whirlpool or early dry hopping. Um, and if you look at, say, right in the middle, HBC 520, really high 3MH. So this is an example of, in this breeding program, in the decision making, attributes like this and components like this can kind of lead to um, a being being pushed along through the through the process. Uh, Laurel is a good example. Really high linalool. Brewers love to see high linalool in their citra. In their citra, we know Laurel and citra go together and kind of help you guide guide you through making a recipe. Uh, I do tell brewers if you're using a zaka in your you know early active fermentation dry hop and it works, don't reinvent the wheel. But if you're making a new recipe, kind of glance into this chart and can kind of give you some good uh, tips towards making a good decision on how and when to use these hops. To dive right into kind of a little overview of the, of the Citra brand, that first statement kind of sums it all up. It's a rock star of hop varieties. I've had a brewer call it a sledgehammer can't overuse it, uh, use it liberally. It'll make you look really great as a brewer, just great hop. Um, the most popular hop for craft breweries right now to contract, uh, it's, it's definitely our, our most popular variety. Uh, cross began in 1992. Originally it was a noble cross and it stuck around until 2008 when it was released. Uh, in 2012, I believe the acreage of Citra was around 530 acres and currently we're over 7,000 acres. So you can kind of see even in the past eight years, just how that the popularity of Citra has really jumped. Uh, citrus character, tropical undertones, best used as a late kettle, whirlpool, and dry hop addition. Um, going over to the left, you'll kind of see a little bit of a higher alpha acid. And then going down to the bottom left and looking at the oil breakdown and just kind of referencing some of the compounds that I previously mentioned linalool and geraniol, those are two indicators to me of biotransformation potential. And if you look at the percent of total oil uh, for linalool, 0.6 to 0.9, I always use 1% of total oil for these compounds as the kind of quote elevated level. So you can see that the detection threshold is low. It does not take much of this compound to just really pop in your beer. So Linalool and geraniol are, are kind of um, quick indicators to me of that kind of like that bio transformation potential. And again, citra is going to have um, elevated levels of those two. Right in the middle is our radar spider chart, which will show a quickly quickly show you that it's really trending towards citrus uh, tropical notes, which is obviously very very desirable um, currently. To the right, you'll see examples of our two ounce Citra brand T90 pack. And below that is the one ounce cryo hop um, package. The cryo hop is our concentrated lupulin uh, product. So we basically removed the back leaf, concentrated the lupulin and the oils into a pellet form. Um, this product, you know, looking at the two ounces for the T90, the one ounce for the cryo is equivalent. So the cryo usage rate would be 50% of your T90. So if you're using this in a recipe, I would tend to want to use the Citra product in your chilled whirlpool, cooled whirlpool, or a dry hop and use it at 50% of the T90 usage rate. Two examples of Citra prominent beers in the market, other half, a double dry hop, all Citra everything, and then to the right, one that's close to my heart, Toppling Goliath, uh, brewing company Pseudo Sioux. It's a great balanced citra hop. And if you look at the descriptor, 
it's kind of going to match up to what I just discussed, the grapefruit, citrus, mango, the notes, um, great beer. If you're in either one of these markets and have access to these, I recommend giving them a try. The Mosaic brand is the daughter of Simcoe, or a daughter of Simcoe, started in 2001, released in 2012. Very uh, unique aromatic. It's very high yielding for the grower. Um, it's real hard to pinpoint one descriptor, thus the name Mosaic. Mango, tangerine, bubblegum, I, I, I think blueberry, I think pineapple. I think all of these uh, kind of are encompassed within Mosaic. Um, every September, when brewers come to hop harvest and they want to do hop selection, so my larger customers will come out and they'll pick their lots and we'll do a rub and sniff of the hop cones. Um, I always find that very slow, tropical, very difficult to pick uh, one attribute in these lots. But we do see subtle changes in this variety that occur based on harvest window. And the harvest window will be a, a projected to be a week in September, and that will shift a little from Washington to Oregon to Idaho. But within that week, we see early mosaic, early pick mosaic, elevated blueberry notes. Midweek, we start to see pineapple notes. And then late in the week, you start to see some some dank notes on it, uh, dank being, you know, the pine, um, kind of kind of like it starts to t trend towards maybe what, what we don't want to see. So, again, there's so, there's so much going on in Mosaic, and I always say it's like a heavy aroma, but you're just going to get lots of different attributes out of it. Uh, best used in, as a late kettle, whirlpool, and dry hop addition. Looking at that oil breakdown again, uh, I really like to focus on that geraniol level being elevated. So it's a great hop to, to use in your active uh, early dry hop, active fermentation early dry hops. Um, really going to have bio transformation potential. And then the spider radar radar chart here is going to again show trends towards uh, that citrus tropical berry, berry notes. So very, very uh, great variety for IPAs. Some examples of some mosaic beers in the market. Two kind of heavy hitters here in the craft brewing world. Trillium made a cutting tiles double IPA with mosaic. And uh, like this descriptors of candied peach, nectarine, um, just kind of really what you're going to really get out of out of mosaic. Um, and Bearded Iris Brewing Company made a beer called Home, Home Style. Uh, soft, juicy, mixed citrus, berry, um, again, powerhouse hop for, for IPAs. Warrior Brand. Warrior Brand is a, is a bittering hop and a capital letters clean bitterness. Um, it was selected and released due to its alpha acid levels as an alternative to Nugget. Uh, great aromatics for bittering hop and it's um, used best in early kettle additions to drive up your IBUs. So this is going to be a hop that's going to be high alpha acid. Um, spider chart does show, you know, you're, you're over here in the, in the range you want to be for, for citrus. You could use it as later additions in your process, but uh, we're really focused on it as a, as a clean bittering hop. Finally, the example of a beer in the market that contains all three of these hops is Surly Brewing Company in Minneapolis. A beer called Axeman, used to be called Todd the Axeman. Uh, American style IPA or West Coast IPA and utilizes all three of these hops in the manner that I, um, that I express. Warrior for bittering, Citro Mosaic for the aroma um, additions. And it's about 65 IBU, I believe. Um, so kind of a, a simple beer, and they're very, Surly's very uh, forward with sharing homebrew recipe versions of their beers. So this is one I recommend if, if it's in your market and uh, and, you, and you're using the Virtual Haze IPA kit and you want to you want to reference beer or something to to drink while you're brewing. This is a great beer to to go out and try. Turn it over to LD for a couple. Um, go through the next few slides. All right, Steve. Thank you very much. I see. 
that was uh, that was extremely informative. I've uh, I've had the privilege of of, um, of going through a couple of the the lineage uh, educational pieces just over time, and uh, you really hit the, the the nail on the head there. So thank you very much. I learned uh, learned a lot of new things there. Uh, this survivables chart that you put together, thank you very much. I'll, uh, I'm going to keep a hold of that slide because uh, I think that's going to help me as a home brewer myself as well. Um, so um, everybody else that's in attendance here, um, thank you very much for being with us. Uh, again, thanks, Steve, for doing such a great job putting together the slide deck. Uh, LD Carlson was founded in 1970 by Larry Carlson. Uh, we're conveniently positioned here in Kent, Ohio, which is just south of Cleveland. Uh, distributing about 5,000 different products, uh, including that as our flagship Brewer's Best, which we did do a showcase with yesterday. I see a lot of familiar names in the chat bar over here. So thank you guys for joining us again here. Um, we are proud distributors of the premium hot products with Yakima Chief. We've been doing business together for quite a long time, um, and we have a wonderful relationship. We're very happy to be here along with YCH uh, to bring this information to you. Um, what we're going to do here, our part is going to be very quick, but we wanted to introduce the Virtual Haze IPA Recipe Kit. Uh, Steve, if you give me a flip on the slideshow there. Um, this is available in homebrew stores now. So if you have a, a local homebrew retailer uh, that, uh, that you visit frequently, they will have this. If they don't have it yet, they can get it for you. It was released last week and has done extremely well for us. Uh, we partnered with uh, YCH. Uh, Steve, myself, and Sean uh, worked on the recipe to make sure that we were pulling together a nice, uh, clean, hazy IPA that everybody uh, attending virtual or virtual home brew con can come together and enjoy as well. So I know that um, Sean has been pulling a few names uh, while we're going through the slideshow here, and he's got a couple he's going to read right now, and we're going to send you guys a free virtual haze kit all right guys so lucky winners to get a virtual haze ipa kit is going to be uh nick gregg rob zimmer and edward o'neill you guys could send us an email to info at brewersbestkits.com with your contact information and shipping address we'll uh we'll get those kits heading out you guys' way asap we'll go ahead and post the uh email address right now. Thanks, Sean. Uh, thanks again, everybody, for joining us here. Um, I know that we probably have uh, quite a few Q&A questions that, uh, that need to come up. Uh, Sean and I are going to be here. I have a feeling most of it's going to be for you, Steve. So uh, we'll turn it back over to you. We're here if you need us. All right. Thanks, guys. Looks like we do have nine questions so far. So let's, let's jump okay. right in here. Let me pull these up. Looks like our most popular question from Carl. At some point, do all hop varieties become public domain so that people can grow them at home? Will citra rhizomes become available for home brewers slash gardeners? There is a time period that expires to where it can be, the, the patent will run out. So I, I believe Simcoe will be the first. Um, so the answer is yes, uh, it will be. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's similar to um, thinking about something that you know, it's, the patent is for, I don't know, we'll make up a number, 10 years or whatever, 20 years, and then it runs out and then um, becomes available to grow. All right. Thanks, Steve. Uh, another question here from Charlie. With breeding taking years before bringing to the market, how nimble are you to trends? How do you uh, forecast what, what may be popular five to 10 years down the road? I believe we're, we're nimble in that we're looking at trends, but also looking at, at quality at the compounds, the oil compounds in the hop, and then how, how are brewers uh, using it? So say we're, we're looking at um, a target of having a alternative to something that is um, currently in demand or currently isn't grown in the US, but we're trying to figure out a way that, that we can grow it here and have it mimic or be close to say a noble hop variety. We're gonna look at a lot of options but mostly around what is in that hop that we feel like is going to make it more similar to the target so there's varieties that, that, that we currently don't grow that we have obviously have people that, that, that want to, to to use it 
are, are for specific reasons, like it's noble qualities or, or um, you know, very specific aroma attributes. So we're kind of working uh, within our program of what exists towards, um, you know, how do we do these crosses to keep certain traits or, or really emphasize certain things, but also kind of like move it forward. So uh, when I look at the lists we have currently, there are some on there to me that I'm like, wow, this is really underwhelming when it comes to the aroma. But maybe I'm not considering the pick window or the, the yields. So these things, like, they exist and they kind of um, are moved forward in the breeding program. But, but we're looking to kind of cross those traits into varieties that maybe have really great aromas. So it's sort of an ongoing, ongoing process. And, and things get dropped off, like, you know, in year four, it's just there's no future for this and it just kind of goes away. So in that way, we're, we're looking at current trends and looking towards the future, but also, you know, kind of staying true to what our goals are and, and what we do best. <clears throat> Excellent, thanks, Steve. Uh, Thomas wants to know more about cryo hops. What can you tell us? So the cryo hop is basically we've removed the back leaf. So what we've done is we've taken the, the, the whole cone and we've cryogenically we freeze it and it shatters and we basically accumulate the, the lupulin glands and then we repelletize that. So the, the brack leaf or the debittered leaf goes away and it contains like a little bit of a residual lupulin on it, but we've really taken the, the quote good stuff out and really concentrated for the brewer. So if you're adding this to a whirlpool in really high amounts, you're putting less vegetal matter in there. Your, your, your yields are going to go up. You're going to have less vegetal notes. If you're using it at a high dry hop rate, you're putting less vegetal matter in there. Your yields are going to go up. There's less of a, of a hop pile at the bottom of your fermenter. Uh, it, can, it can decrease uh, hop creep, which is the restarting fermentation after uh, high levels of dry hopping. There's certain enzymes in the hop leaf that can um, kind of break down some of the non-fermentable sugars into simpler sugars and kind of restart that. So there's a lot of benefits to using the, the cryo hop. And if you look at the alpha levels, they're going to be roughly 1.6 to 2, point to, two, two times the level of the 290. So thus the, the half the usage rate. And it's been a very popular product. Um, it's a super cold production line. There's no heat gain. Uh, it's, it's great. And it's been very popular with commercial brewers that, that just love the, the decreased shipping costs, the increased yields, and then putting less vegetal matter uh, in their beers. So it's, it's a great thing to try out. Again, I would stick to using it in your, your 180 to, you know, 170 to 180 degree Fahrenheit Whirlpool. I use it in your dry hop. You can use it in the kettle, just the alpha levels are so high, it can really drive your IBUs up. So it's, it's something to where, you know, using it strategically in the right spots can be really beneficial. Excellent. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Carl wants to know how similar is a new hop plant to an older plant of a well-established variety? For example, is a Cascade today essentially on change from a Cascade 25 years ago? Yeah, like I said, that's, uh, that's farming practice. And you'll see terroir of different uh, growing regions. Um, I see a lot, of, uh, a lot of Chinook grown in Michigan. And it's great. It's just different than what Chinook grown in Washington will be. Uh, so I hesitate to really say... There's a lot that goes into it as far as, you know, when you say changes. Um, hot plants have different different morphologies. The cones look different. Uh, but, you know, ideally over time, we, as hop growers and, and, and you know, we're probably providing hops to brewers, we want, we want to see minimal change over time. And I think that's where the, the hop breeding company, a breeding program in Yakima Chief Ranch is really puts a lot of resource time and money into trying to keep, uh, varieties, you know, in a tight window with their quality and sensory. <clears throat> Excellent. Our next question is from Brian. He wants to know, is there much research in the works to develop varieties that can tolerate growing in higher temperatures, i.e. southern U.S., or more drought-resistant climates, the high desert? Well, you know, our growing regions, like Washington is, is, is high desert and it's fed by irrigation. Um, so really, we have plants that are hot above ground and wet below. That's perfect. Uh, long days of sunlight is perfect. 
Uh, Oregon's a little bit of a different climate, it's a little bit wetter, a little bit rainier. They, they fight some, you know, some different challenges when it comes to the molds and the mildews and even the seed counts can be, can be higher. Uh, so I, I feel like, I don't think that we're really targeting that in the breeding program, but you kind of see that come out um, further along, like Idaho 7, right? that's now being grown also in Washington. And at first you're like, you know, what are we going to get? Like, what's going to change? And so it's kind of exciting. You know, you see a, a variety that's developed in a, in a certain region and then, you know, can it be grown um, somewhere else? But I don't really know that that's the, one of the upfront um, goals, but obviously we love to see varieties that um, can withstand some drought. It's just a, it's a good safety net to have. <clears throat> Thanks, Steve. Dan has another question on cryo hops. It says, why is there such a limited selection of cryo hops? Will more become available? Well, on the commercial level, we have most of our varieties are, are available to to craft breweries, and each year more and more varieties. Um, we even now have Sriracha Ace available to commercial brewers. Uh, Columbus is a great one that we have that, that brewers like. Um, it's just um, and as far as the homebrew market, you know, I don't know what the plan is, but we on a commercial scale to to craft breweries. Uh, you know, if somebody wants to lend it, cryo, we have it. It's it's. Uh, it's fairly easy for us to just it's a it's a line of production so we have bales that come from a farm and and we send them down the cryo production line or the t90 production line so it's it's we're pretty nimble with it and we have brewers that will contract citra and say hey i want x percent of my citra to be you know cryo and this percent to be t90 and we're pretty nimble with being able to produce either <clears throat> Okay, Mike asks, says in the UK, the FT is reporting the hop industry is at risk of collapse as pubs are shut down, beer production's down due to COVID-19, and brewers are unwilling to contract for the next next year's hops. And if growers have no contracts, they may remove acreage. Is there is this a problem in the US for your growers? I have not seen that as a problem at all. Um, working through the COVID landscape, um, you know, with my anticipation of, you know, what's gonna happen with brewers, I've seen hop usage be extremely stable. I've had brewers that need more hops. Um, you know, even with, with beer production being, you know, a little bit down, I've seen very little um, decrease in demand for hops, at least from my region. Um, I have brewers adding more hops for next year. Um, I think, you know, speaking just to the current present day, it, it's been, um, you know, I'm glad this, it's the case. It's been not impacted maybe to the level I anticipated. And so it's great to hear it. And brewers are very savvy at, you know, switching up how they're selling beer, how they're distributing beer. And I have brewers that's, that sold more beer the past three months than they did previously. And I love to hear that because it's, you know, it's not always the case. And again, it depends on the state you're in and distribution laws and how, how easy it is to sell beer out of the tap room. But, but overall, I would say, you know, the, the, down, the beer sales might be down a little, but I, the hop usage, I think, has is, is stayed pretty steady. All right. Doug says, any cause and corrective action for unpleasant bitterness as a result of Quebec yeast and hop bitterness? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not super knowledgeable with, with, with like, because I'm not a yeast supplier. Like, I struggle sometimes with, very yeast specific questions. I had a guy ask me the other day, like about dry hopping a, a Britannomyces beer, and I'm like, uh, I don't, I don't know. Maybe some best practices around very specific um, yeast strains, but with like the ripe yeast, I would say, you know, I would approach it like I would any other yeast strain. It's kind of a tough question to answer, and I apologize. I probably didn't give a very good answer to that. All good, Steve. Next up from Charlie, He's, he wants to know more about how you create your blends. He used a cluster fugget from last year to make a dark mild. So the hot blends will be, you know, a combination of, of, you know, what's our target alpha? And then looking at that survivable chart, it's kind of a good, great example of, of, of targeting a blend. We just did a, a trial that we called a, a biotransformation focused blend. And we took varieties off of that to the left part of that chart and said, and then looked at specific lots to say, okay, which ones have screaming high levels of these, of these compounds that we like. And we made thousands of pounds of this in a cryo format and got it to a lot of craft breweries to use. And we said, okay, here's, here, you know, use it in your, your early active fermentation dry hop. 
and then tell us what you think. And we'll probably do that blend again next year. We might tweak it a little. So it's it's also, it could be like we, we want to make a, a blend that is uh, multi-purpose. You know, it could be for an overseas market where it's, hey, this is one hop you can buy and, and you know, maybe the market there is a little bit behind with, with how to make IPAs and how to use hops. It's, this is this will kind of cover all your bases with one with one blend. Um, you know, and it can be too it's something that we can make that's cost um, effective for breweries. Using up you know varieties that we have have that are in excess uh, and making it into kind of a new product. So uh, the blends are always I think we're always pushing forward with uh, having some part of it be very obviously very uh, efficient or effective or cost effective or it's bringing something new uh, to the brewing world. And I always think that that bio, biotransformative blend is a great future uh, homebrew product because you just buy one pack of hops and it's going to cover your bases. And it's, you know, it's pretty indicative of how to use it. And so there's a lot of potential there to just uh, come up with some new, new blends that, you know, take some, take some pressure off the brewer and just kind of like, you know, it's very, clear how to use it, where to use it in the process. And then again, if we can make it cost effective, it's a win-win. Thanks, Steve. Charles wants to know, are any hop varieties genetically modified? No, Our, ours are not. There's, it's done on family farms. Um, it's, it's, you know, hand cross pollinating. It's, it's not, um, there's no, nothing like that happens, at least with our program. Excellent. Thanks, Steve. It looks like this one might have been answered, but I'm going to throw it out to you. Uh, from Michael, what is the best way to store your hop pellets once the bag is opened? I bought a large bag of your Citra and haven't opened it yet, but it should last me over multiple brew sessions. I store all my hops in the freezer, original bags, and then in the Ziploc freezer bags. What's your thought? The key would be to remove oxygen from the package environment. So ideally, it would be like a nitrogen flush. Now you could use CO2. And then you just kind of put a blanket on that hop and kind of push the air out and then seal it up. That's going to be your best bet to keep it as close to um, the, keep it as close to the unopened package as possible. The minute it's open, you will it will start to oxidize and degrade. But that's going to be your best bet. A lot of uh, commercial craft brewers do that. They'll purge their open bags and just kind of duct tape them shut. Um, you know, I've seen some pretty creative ways to do it. But basically, you just want to get the air out or the oxygen out and just kind of create a, a blanket of CO2 or nitrogen or something in there that will that will preserve it. <clears throat> Excellent. Steve says he has some NUG033 from USA Hops that he got from CBC. Do you know if it has become a named hop? That's not one of ours, and I, I'm, I apologize. I'm not, I'm not sure, um, so I can't really speak to that variety. All right. Um, last one as of right now, make sure you add questions if you have more. Uh, this one, do you guys feel there is any proof of terroir? I have been, I've seen studies that indicate terroir exists and others that show no discernible proof. There's definitely differences in, in terroir. Um, but again, there's lots of factors that are there as well. So I have brewers that come to hop selection that are focused on say Oregon Citra and they want to see Oregon Citra Farms, Oregon, Oregon Farm, Oregon Farm, Oregon Farm. And then maybe not taking into account also pick date and pick window. And um, so there, there's there's things that when brewers are tend to really focus on one thing, you know, they kind of show them, okay, well, here's the same farm picked four days later. And they're like, wow, that's really different. Or wow, I prefer the early pick, but not the pick that's four days later. So there's, 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 there's things to consider when you're saying it's different, but there will be a, a slight difference in terroir for sure, um, going from say Germany to the U.S. or even Michigan to Washington. Um, within the Pacific Northwest, I think it's pretty minimal, but but they're probably a really 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 savvy sensory expert could probably tell you there's a difference. He probably wouldn't be able to tell you which one was from which state, but um, all things being equal, there, there there will be a difference because it's different climate and different parameters within that climate. But um, yeah, so our goal is to, you know, obviously we want it to be as uniform as we can have it be. <clears throat> Excellent. Thanks so much, Steve. That was our last question. 
Uh, we'll give it another minute or two in case anyone has any questions. But I did want to say thank you again to LD Carlson and to Yakima Chief Hops and to Steve, Bobby, and Sean. Uh, thanks for the great presentation today. Um, mm -hmm. Thanks for your support of HomebrewCon Online. We really appreciate it. I just did have another question pop up. Um, this one is also on. say, oh, go ahead. I also will say there's some great comments coming in here on the on the right that are covering some of my questions. So I want to say whoever said vacuum bag, that's a great point um, for, for purging your bags. So just wanted to kind of make a note of that. Absolutely. We did have another question pop in on cryo hops. What are the available sizes for cryo hops for the home brewer? A one ounce pack, which would be equivalent to your two ounce T90. Uh, I think that would probably be the most popular size, but maybe Bobby can speak to that from LD. What was the question one more time? I'm sorry. What are the pack sizes for cryo for home brewers besides the one yeah. ounce? What one ounce? Yeah, yeah. We do, we do have uh, we have one pound sizes available. That's more geared towards the commercial market. But uh, but we do carry all the the major varieties for uh, for the one ounce cryo hops. Excellent. Um, any comment on hop hash? Um, not, not here. We don't we don't carry it. No. Yeah, that's different. I mean, a lot of people confuse that with cryo, but it's not it's not remotely the same product. Um, I know some places offer that. I, I can't really speak to what that is, but. I'd stick to the prior product if you're going down that route. <laughs> Excellent. Edward wants to know if there's ever been one hop that just changed your life. You know, you're going to probably laugh at this, but every year at hop selection, I a lot of times I'll evaluate the varieties blind. And, you know, I don't know what the variety is. I'm just kind of rubbing and sniffing. And almost every year it's, it's Chinook uh, grown in Washington. And as a former brewer and former, you know, person who worked in a craft brewery, Chinook was always back of mind. But now I'm like, man, this, there's some great Chinook out there. And I feel like if I got that every single time, I would, it's just bubble gum and mint. And it's a combination of things that a lot of it just pops for me. So I would say that is um, surprisingly probably a variety that I've discovered since being in this job that really, really, really appeals to me that, um, I was pretty not excited about as, as a brewer. So again, like sometimes, it's, you know, focus on what you're getting out of the variety and not like, is it the cool new, uh, the cool new name? So there's, there's lots of great choices. And so just keep your mind open and hopefully you'll find something that blows your mind. <clears throat> Excellent. We have one more from Edward. He wants to know if there's any underappreciated hops that surprise you as not used as much. Yeah, I mean, like, there's varieties like uh, Crystal. It's great multi-use hop. And I would say, like, the hops that can fill a, a need, say, like, Palisade, when I refer to that, something that can be used across, like, lagers, pilsners, but then also in, in IPAs. Um, a lot of times brewers might say, hey, my, my check size is just so inconsistent, and it's hard to get, and it's really affected by droughts. And the alpha is 1.6, and then it's 4. I want something that's consistent, and um, there's some under the radar ones that you know that, that are that are great for to fill that need that aren't you know Hellertal Middle Fruit or or Czech Sauce, but you know there's like Crystal and Palisade, and those are ones that that I kind of I, I just like them, and they're cause, because of that being able to use them in, in many ways. <clears throat> Excellent. Dan has a question. I'm not sure if we'll be able to get it, answer this one or not, but maybe he wants to know, isn't Chinook what Sierra Nevada uses in Bigfoot? No, well, I'm not, I'm not familiar. Um, yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, I can't speak to Sierra Nevada's recipe, but, um, probably a Google search. All right. Um, that is our last question as of right now. Do you guys have anything else to add before we wrap it up here today? No, I, I think from from our end here with uh, with LD Carlson Brewers Best, we just want to say thank you again um, for the BA for putting everything together. Steve, great job again today. Thank you so much for all your hard work and all your effort. Uh, the rest of the YCH team, uh, thanks to all the uh, all the home brewers that have been with us here. And uh, yeah, I'm really been enjoying the posts here. Thank you, everybody. We really appreciate you being here.
makes sense. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you guys. Thanks again to LD Carlson and to Yakima Chief Hops. Thanks for the great presentation today. We'll see you in the next one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.